And the message that we're going to look at this morning is called Israel Alone. The fact that Israel has become a nation again is just an amazing fulfillment of prophecy. Let's read together Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 and 33. Jesus says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. In Jesus' message to the disciples here on the Mount of Olives, he's giving them clues as to what to look for before the end comes. And one of those is the blossoming of the fig tree. What is the parable of the fig tree? When Jesus says to learn something, it's a good idea to get a grasp on what he's saying. And so here he would teach us this morning to learn the parable of the fig tree. Well, three chapters earlier over in Matthew chapter 21 and also in Mark chapter 11, we read that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he approached a fig tree and he cursed it. He was looking for fruit, but there was no fruit on it. And so he cursed it. He said, may no fruit be found on you ever. The next day when the disciples walked by, they looked and there that thing had shriveled. The Bible says it shriveled from the roots up. It had lost its grip with the soil. Its leaves had withered and faded. It had completely shriveled and the disciples were amazed and they asked Jesus about it. Well, here he tells them to learn the parable of the fig tree. Over in Luke chapter 13, Jesus illustrates that the fig tree is the nation of Israel. And so it's important to understand. To illustrate what would happen to Israel, Jesus cursed the fig tree. As a result of Israel rejecting Jesus Christ... They shriveled as a nation. Like the fig tree, they did not receive their own Messiah. And as a result of that, they would be cursed. The fig tree withered, and so did Israel. Cursed for their rejection of Jesus, their own Messiah, the Jews were scattered over all the world to be as, well, as God would say to Cain in Genesis 4.12, a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And so the diaspora of the Jews over all the earth, and Cain killed Abel, because his sacrifice was better. And so Jesus would be slain by his own people. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24 says that the blood of Jesus speaks better than that of Abel. And so as Cain was sent out over the world, the Bible says that God marked him so that he would be protected. And so God has marked Israel for protection in the world. And for 2,000 years, the Jews, the people of Israel, have been preserved as they have wandered. But they won't wander forever. The parable of the fig tree says that when they begin to bear fruit again, when they begin to blossom, as Jesus says in our text, when it begins to put forth its branch and become tender once again, that is when Israel will be restored. That is the parable of the fig tree. Remember in Isaiah chapter 54, verses 7 and 8, God says, For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you. For a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And so what we look for in the prophetic timetable is the regrowth and the regathering of Israel. That is the fig tree. Jesus said, watch, learn the parable of the fig tree. It's as if he's saying, watch Israel. Like the fig tree, they've been cursed, they've shriveled, they bore no fruit. They've been without a land. But keep your eye on the Jews. Because when they begin to take root again, when they're regathered into the land, when they put out branches, when they begin to grow and blossom, get ready, Jesus would say, because I'm coming soon. Get ready. Watch out. That's the parable of the fig tree. A couple of points I want to make to you this morning as we look at history and we look at the Bible is, first of all, God will never forsake the Jews. Secondly, the second point that we're going to look at is that Israel itself as a country is a miracle. And thirdly, the Bible says that in the last days, all the nations of the world will be gathered against Israel. And so the first point is that God will never forsake the Jews. Some people will say that, well, Israel rejected Jesus, so God has sealed their fate forever. They're forever cursed. Now, they did shrivel. They were cursed, but not forever. They were set aside for a time, but not dismissed forever. We've got to get that straight. As Christians, we need to know this for sure, that God will never forsake the Jew. How do I know that? Jeremiah chapter 31. Turn in your Bibles just to the left. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'm going to read out of the New American Standard. I like the way it phrases it better. Jeremiah 31 verses 35 through 37. Jeremiah 
Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order, the sun, the moon, the stars, departs from me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. If the heaven above can be measured and the fountains of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. What is God saying here? That as you saw the sun rise this morning, it is proof that God still will be faithful to the Jews. If you want to destroy the Jews, you first got to deal with the sun, the moon, the stars. You've got to search out the depths beyond uh, the earth and in the deeps of the ocean. You've got to be able to measure the universe, which scientists still haven't been able to do. Jesus in that passage to his disciples on the Mount of Olives says, this generation shall not pass away. That generation, in other words, what he's saying is the generation, the genes of the Jews will not pass away. It looks like it will. Sometimes when you look at history, you think, boy, the Jews might be destroyed altogether. It was about 60, 70 years ago in Germany when it looked like there was a chance that the nation of Israel would be completely wiped off the face of the planet. But they weren't. The fact that the people of Israel exist is proof that God is watching over them. The Queen of England many years ago was asking the prime minister at the time, his name was Benjamin Disraeli. He was a Jewish believer. And she said to him, Mr. Prime Minister, what evidence can you give me for the existence of God? He gave her two words, the Jew. The fact that the Jew exists today is amazing. Because they have been hounded and persecuted for thousands of years from the very beginning. And God said it would be that way. Remember when we looked at Genesis chapter 3 and the woman and the man had sinned and God pronounced the judgment upon the serpent. And he said to the serpent, between you and the woman, I will put enmity. And between her seed, that's Jesus, that's the Messiah, and your seed, that's the Antichrist, there will be enmity, there will be fighting. And so from the very beginning of creation, Satan, the devil, has been after the very one who would bear the Messiah. And so obviously he wanted to wipe them out time and time again. If he could destroy the mother, then the child wouldn't be able to come. And the nation of Israel has been sort of the mother, the bearer of the Messiah. And when you get all the way, and the whole scripture is about that. It's about the persecution, the hostility, the hatred of Satan against the people of God, Israel, who would bear the Messiah. Thank goodness for that, because he has come and we've received him. But when you get all the way to the book of Revelation, you find in Revelation chapter 12, there's a picture of the dragon chasing a woman who gives birth to the Messiah. But he's caught up. And so Satan goes after her to kill her, to destroy her. I like what Mark Twain wrote about the Jews. He said the Jews constitute a tiny percentage of the human race. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of. He's always been heard of. He's as prominent on the planet as any other people. And his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion with the smallness of his bulk. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are also way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He's made a marvelous fight in this world, in all ages, and he's done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself, and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, and then faded off to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, but they're gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in the twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities, age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal, but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Mark Twain would ask. I will answer. It's the Lord's faithfulness. It's the mercy and the plan of God. You see, they did reject Jesus. They did reject their own Messiah, but it was part of the plan of God. As a nation, they were cursed, they were dispersed. But when they rejected Jesus, he became available for all people, Gentiles included. And I, for one, am grateful for that because I'm not a Jew. 
My wife is. My children are, I guess, by virtue of the fact that their mom is. And boy, I tell you what, Jews can talk. I've got five of them in my home. I love them. And they drive me nuts, which is an amazing thing. But here's the point is that if Israel as a nation didn't reject the Messiah, then we would have no hope. And that was always part of the plan of God. It was actually seen in the Old Testament by type. Remember when Joseph was rejected by his brothers. He was sold for silver by one of his brothers, Yehuda or Judas. He was sold for silver and he went into the land of Egypt as a slave, but he was exalted and he sat at the right hand of Pharaoh. And so Jesus would be rejected, sold by silver by one of his own brothers, Judas. And he would be rejected, but the Gentiles received him. And see, the whole part of that process, when the brothers of Joseph refused to accept his gifts and his favor from the father, what was the result? Well, he went to Egypt. There was a famine, a seven-year tribulation on the earth. And in that time of famine, the brothers of Joseph came and they finally recognized him. And so in the process of them rejecting their brother, God's plan behind it all was to save many people. As a matter of fact, when Joseph was finally reunited with his brothers, he told them in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good to save many people. And so the plan of God was to allow Jesus to be rejected by his own people. Why? To save many people. That's you. That's me. But that was the plan of God. And like Joseph, Jesus was rejected. And it resulted in the salvation of anybody in the world who would come to him. But in the end, it will result in the salvation of all the Jews as well. But that's future. You know, in Jesus' day, his own country loved him. They loved him. The only people that didn't like him were the politicians. Israelis loved Jesus. They flocked to come and hear him. As the New Testament puts it in Mark 12, 37, the common people heard him gladly. It was the religious leadership of the nation that rejected him. Jesus would have been their savior, but it was the Orthodox Jews and the politicians that hated him. The working class, the average person embraced him. They loved him. But the politicians, with the help of the Romans, conspired and had him killed. They totally missed it. As Jesus said in Luke 19, 44, you missed the time of your visitation. God in the flesh, I visited you and you missed it. Could you imagine that? Oh, I missed a call on my phone. Oh, it was God. I can't believe I missed it. Well, Jesus, the God of all creation, knocked on the door of Israel and they missed it. But it was because of the religious leaders, their inability and their reluctance to cede power to anybody but themselves. The regular people loved him. Probably 95% of the population loved Jesus and would have embraced him. But those leaders riled them up. I mean, they, they wanted to hail Jesus. I mean, they put down the palm branches and they welcomed him as the king. But those leaders, oh boy, they never taught the, the, the regular people the word of God. They never taught them anything. They just taught them the traditions of men which led them into bondage. And so when the time came, in the end, the Pharisees riled the crowd up to actually chant against Jesus. Remember what they said? His blood be on us and on our children's head. And it was. That's exactly what happened to the people of Israel. The punishment for rejecting Jesus fell upon them. 35 years after the, those Jews shouted against Jesus, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Caesar would send troops against Jerusalem. They would surround it. They would burn the temple with fire. They would slaughter thousands and thousands of Jews. His blood be on us, on our heads and our children's heads. And they were. The Jews were scattered, the temple destroyed. The nation itself was dismantled by the Romans and carried to the ends of the earth. But does that mean that God's done with the Jewish people? No, it doesn't. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, asks that very question. Paul the Apostle says, Has God cast away his people? Cast away means to throw out, to shove off, to push away. He says, Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Actually, Romans chapters 9 through 11 are very important because Paul was explaining to the church there what would happen with Israel. What happened early in the church was that the Gentiles were receiving Jesus just like crazy. Thousands and thousands were coming to the Lord, but the Jewish people were holding on to the temple. They were holding on to the past. They were holding on to their religion. And so all of a sudden, the church 
which embraced a Jewish Messiah was not filled with Jews, but filled with Gentiles. What's going to happen to the nation of Israel? What's going to happen to the temple? What's going to happen to Jerusalem? What's going to happen to the, the civil the civil organization of the national identity of the Jews. I mean, even the Christians were very uh, concerned about this early on. Acts chapter 1, remember when Jesus was resurrected? What did they say to him? Are you going to at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They identified the kingdom of God with the nation of Israel, but God's plans were much bigger than that. The church of God would spread out over the whole world and not be identified with a single nation, but with a church, with the bride of Christ from every ethnic group, every color people. Jesus would die for for every person on the earth that would accept him, that would receive him. But the Jews had it in their mind that, no, Jesus is only for our nation. And so they said, are you going to restore the kingdom to the, the nation of Israel? And Jesus said, don't even worry about it. Just go preach the gospel. It is not for you to know the times and seasons that God has fixed in his order. Well, 2,000 years would pass and the church would be primarily Gentile. It would be non-Jewish. And so Paul would tell the Romans about what would happen to the Jews. And in chapter 9, 10, and 11, he gives three important chapters about the Jews, about Israel. You can probably remember it very easily by remembering chapter 9 deals with the past election. Chapter 10 deals with their present rejection. And chapter 11 deals with their future collection. Their past election, God chose them. Their present rejection, they didn't choose God. But their future collection, God will gather them in. And so in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, he asks that question, has God cast them away? Certainly not. And then he finishes it up in Romans 11, verse 25, and he says to the church, I don't want you to be ignorant of this thing and be wise in your own opinion that blindness has happened to Israel in part until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so all Israel will be saved. See, what he was saying in chapter 11 is there's going to be some Christians that will say, hey, we have been grafted into the nation. See, Paul would give this illustration. He'd say, you Christians, it's as if God pulled apart part of that olive tree, and he grafted in a shoot, a wild branch into the rich blessings, the root of all the promises that were given to Israel. Remember, Jesus said, I am the true vine. If you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. What he is saying is, I am all the blessings that God gave to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Israel as a nation. And if you plug into me, all those blessings belong to you. And so Paul would say to the Romans that you have been grafted in to the olive tree. This time the picture is not a fig tree, but an olive tree. And he says all the blessings in Christ Jesus in another place are yes and amen. They all belong to you as a believer, as a Christian. And so he recognizes that some of those Christians will will then say, as he poses the question to them in chapter 11 of Romans, somebody might say, hey, God chose us over the Jews. The Jews were broken off so that we could be grafted in. And Paul responds with that. He says, hey, that's true, but watch it. Be careful because God broke them off, but he could break you off and plug them back in. So don't be arrogant and speak against the Jews because God still loves them. Earlier, he says, has God cast off the Jews? Certainly not. I'm a Jew and I've come into faith to Jesus Christ. See, Paul didn't want them to be ignorant of these things, but this is where the church is grossly ignorant in many places. And here's why. Many churches have actually turned against Israel, and I'll tell you why. A few hundred years ago, when the Bible became widely available, it was read and studied. During that period, we know it as the Reformation, the protest was against the Roman Catholic Church. That's why the non-Catholic Church is called the Protestant Church, the Protestant. They were protesting against what? Well, they were protesting against the fact that the Roman Catholic Church said that to get to heaven, you've got to get to heaven by works. They, they were upset at the fact that the church was saying you've got to do penance, you've got to say a certain number of prayers. You've, monasticism was big, self-flagellation. You can be accepted by God if you burn a certain number of candles. And all of a sudden, the scriptures were discovered. Nobody could read them before because they weren't translated into their language. So all of a sudden, thousands of people began to look through the scriptures and And one monk by the name of Martin Luther discovered that the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. You mean I don't have to pay the church to be forgiven? Well, that's what the Bible says. And it was the period of the reformation. The church was being reformed. They were protesting 
against what the church was saying at that time. And as they looked at the scripture, it was amazing because they did some some wonderful things. The reformers had to clarify the gospel of grace. When Jesus was nailed up, the gospel was nailed down, they would say. That it's by grace alone. When you come to God, it is by the work of Jesus, not your own works. And so come by faith. Faith is the important thing, not works. And so it's the new covenant in the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, that's better than the old covenant of works, which is what the church had largely gone back to. And so the Protestant reformers would say the new covenant replaces the old covenant, but they went too far. That's true. The new covenant replaces the old covenant, but the new people do not replace the old people. What they said is that the church replaces Israel. But they didn't. The church doesn't replace Israel. See, there's a lot of verses in the Old Testament that speak about Israel becoming great. But the Jews were still without a homeland. They were scattered. They were persecuted. They had no national identity. And so when these scholars looked in the Old Testament at all these verses, I mean, there are promises in the Old Testament about Israel being a nation that is above all other nations, having this civil autonomy and authority, this national identity that was above and beyond any others. And so these scholars looked at these verses and they said, there's no way that this speaks about the modern nation of Israel. Why? It doesn't exist. It can't. There's no way that these verses talk about Israel. They must, therefore, in their mind, they concluded they must speak about the church. And so as they looked through the Old Testament, they put on a lens, a filter, where they spiritualized and made the Old Testament allegorical. And they said there is no future for the nation of Israel. It's all referring to the church. And the theologians embraced the idea that the church had actually replaced Israel. To deal with those promises that God made for Israel, they said, well, they just all apply to the church. Now, it is true. That if I believe in Jesus, all the promises to Abraham are yes and amen. God said to Abraham, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And I am blessed because Jesus came out of Abraham. And yet, I don't replace Israel. There's no church in the world. There's no nation in the world that will replace Israel. And so passages that should be taken literally were at that time made symbolic. They were made spiritual in order to agree with the contemporary status of things that the Jews weren't with a homeland. They had no place. They had no nation. And so they said Israel was rejected by God. Finally, it's finished. And the church took its place. And instead of being grafted in, the church now gutted out Israel, supplanting it, replacing it. And today it's called replacement theology. And you got to be careful about it. Supersessionism. It's hostility toward the Jews rose then. And many of the reformers, though they have great doctrine, When it comes to grace and being saved, they grew anti-Semitic. Martin Luther, as a matter of fact, at the last three years of his life, he was grossly anti-Semitic. It was sad. He wrote a book called On the Jews and Their Lies, 65,000 words about how their synagogues and homes should be burned. Earlier in his life, he wanted to reach the Jews. He said, I can see they've been so mistreated by the Roman Catholic Church that if I was a Jew, you know, I wouldn't want to become a Christian. I would rather become a hog than a Christian. Because they've been so mistreated. And so Martin Luther took to the Jews that he knew the gospel of grace. They rejected that too. It wasn't their season. And so in the end of his life, he wrote these radical things, hostility toward the Jews. It was sad because that caught on. That began to spread. The Lutheran church has actually rejected those things that Martin Luther said. He was a great scholar, a great theologian. And yet what happened is the church continued to be anti-Semitic. Some churches are still hostile to Israel. And this is why I point this out, because it's a growing movement. I believe it's a sign of the times, the last days. Every nation in the world will be against Israel, and so will the visible church, but not true believers, not true Christians. In uh, 2004, the Presbyterian Church in the United States voted to divest from Israel. Divestment is the opposite of investment. It's basically to boycott. We're not going to buy anything that's produced by Israel, they said. Presbyterian Church, United States of America, 2004, voted against it. The Anglican Church did the same thing. The following year, the United Methodist Church and the United Church of Christ followed suit, along with the World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches represents 550 million Christians in 120 different countries. It represents 340 different denominations. 
All of these voted to divest from Israel. In other words, boycott everything Israel. Did you know that? It's all happening. It's part of the last days. The Protestant church in Germany has actually boycotted Israel. And this trend is rising in denominations in these last days. And I think it demonstrates the liberalism and hatred for the Jews, which is tolerated even within the church. Remember, the last day's church, the Bible says, will have departed from the scripture, departed from the Lord. And the movement in the church today illustrates that, a hatred for the Jews. A friend of Michael Moore, an enemy of Israel, Jimmy Carter, wrote a book recently. During his term as president, he was outspoken in his so-called faith in Jesus Christ. Now that he's out of office, well, he just won't seem to go away, but he's equally as outspoken against Israel. His latest book is called Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. He tries to make out Israel as an aggressive violator of human rights. Now, his book is so dishonest. It's such propaganda that even his own staff in the Carter Center is bailing out. His advisor, I'll just read you from an article, December 7th, 2006. The title says, Advisor to Jimmy Carter Resigns in Dispute Over Book. An advisor to former President Jimmy Carter and one-time executive director of the Carter Center has publicly parted ways with his former boss, citing concerns with the accuracy and integrity of Carter's latest book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. The advisor, Kenneth Stein, is a professor of Middle Eastern history and political science at Emory University in Atlanta. He resigned his position Tuesday as a fellow with the Carter Center, ending a 23-year association with the institution. In a two-page letter explaining his actions, Stein called the book, quote, replete with factual errors, copied materials not cited, superficialities, glaring omissions, and simply invented segments. A month later, after Stein resigned, 14 other members of Carter's board of counselors resigned over the blatant anti-Semitism in the book. It seems that, well, in his... Time in office, Carter would get into bed with just about every bloody dictator in the world. He was chummy with Fidel Castro, Saddam Hussein, Ceausescu, who was brutal to the church. Um, Also, Kim Il-sung and his son, Kim Jong-il. One of Carter's closest friends was Yasser Arafat, who was a killer, a a cold-blooded terrorist and a murderer. And you're saying, Bud, why are you even mentioning Jimmy Carter? Well, the reason is this. Because this year at the Willow Creek Leadership Conference... Jimmy Carter is one of the featured speakers. This man hates Israel, but he's going to participate in one of the fastest growing church movements in the world. Willow Creek, Bill Hybels. I don't know why he's inviting him, but I do know this, that somebody who hates Israel with a passion and who gives money and gets money from those who want to destroy Israel off the face of the earth will be speaking to thousands of Christians and influencing them. What's happening in the church today? I don't know. It's the last days. But you can see the influence of Satan's hand all over the world against the Jews. All over the world, political, parapolitical, educational, business, religious organizations are boycotting Israel. In England, just four days ago, the university and college union, these are teachers, college professors, 116,000 of them, voted to boycott Israel. Medical associations are calling for a boycott on Israel. The soccer organization, FIFA, F-I-F-A, is considering boycotting Israel. The Green Party in the United States has already boycotted Israel. Last year in Hawaii, our very own Neil Abercrombie, Abercrombie, I call him, I'm sorry. I don't like him. He hates Israel. God save his soul. Either convert him or kill him, but get him out of there. Seriously. He hates Israel and he hates everything. He is clearly an enemy of God. He's an enemy of everything the scripture stands for. And I used to work in politics. So once you get to know him, you hate him even more. You think you don't like politicians now? Oh, try becoming one. You hate yourself even. That's why I got out. No, but here's the thing. Neil Abercrombie last year, when the Congress passed a resolution against terrorist groups, remember when Hamas won the elections in Palestine? And um, these are these are a, a known terrorist organization that constantly bombs innocent people through suicide bombers. The Congress in the United States wanted to make a statement that we don't support terrorism. 
And so the Senate drafted a resolution and it passed unanimously. One hundred senators agreed that we will not support terrorist organizations like Hamas. And then the resolution came over to the House side and every single member of Congress voted for it, in favor of it, except one, Neil Abercrombie. Back in 2004, on his committee, he lectured the United States Army never to use ordnance or firearms, the bullets that were made by Israel in the war on terror. He made a big stink about it because many of our bullets are purchased from Israel. There's a company in the Midwest and then Israel. They split the contract and Abercrombie heard about that. And he said, we can't use those bullets because Jewish bullets might shoot Palestinians or Al-Qaeda or any person that wants to destroy Israel. (laughs) This guy's crazy. And, you know, he represents every single one of us, which is sad. But that's the way it is. But you see, the world hates Israel. And it's happening all over the place. We'll hear more about it in a second. Countries might be against Israel. The world might hate Israel. Movements might despise their existence and protest them. But let me tell you this, God will never forsake the Jews. And it's good for us as Christians to get on the right side of that argument. Because even the church is going in a direction that's hostile toward Israel. But get this straight in your own heart that God is for them. And he will never reject them. And the only way that you can get to the Jews is you've got to deal with the sun, the moon, the stars. You've got to destroy them all so that you can get to them. Secondly, Israel is a miracle. Their existence today is amazing. Jesus said, learn the parable of the fig tree. Israel's actually taken root in their land. We need to turn over to Hosea chapter 5. Jesus said that Israel will blossom like the fig tree. When they come back into the land, when they grow again, Watch them. It was funny, a couple of years ago, I went to speak on the campus at University of Hawaii. A friend of mine had a class and I went to speak and I was blown away because there was a student in the class that started asking me all these questions about how evil Israel is. And I know a little bit about the situation because my wife's Israeli and I've studied this thing and I know the situation. My, actually, my wife's grandfather was in Israel before it was Israel. It was called Palestine because the uh, the British had, by virtue of political arrangements, actually named the land Palestine. Palestine comes from the name Philistine. Um, they looked at the land. What should we call this? Well, this is the old country of the Philistines, so let's call it Palestine. There is no ethnic group of Palestinians. My grandfather-in-law actually had a card issued by the British that called him a Palestinian. There is no country of Palestine. Now, if we want to create a country of Palestine, fine. But let's not talk about some thousand-year-old history of the Palestinians. Everybody that lives there is just Arabs or Turks or Jewish or Gentile. They're just a mixed group of ethnicities. What happened in 1948 when the United Nations declared in May that Israel was now a nation, all the surrounding countries went to war with them. They invaded Israel. And Israel won the battle. And what happened was, is many of the Muslims, the Arabs that lived in what was now called Israel, because they fought against the Jews and lost their land, they were now refugees. All of the surrounding Muslim countries said, no way you can't come into our country. And so they fought, they were trying to get away. They were trying to escape. And yet the surrounding nations wouldn't accept them. And so they stayed in the land of Israel. And so they're called Palestinians. But they've only existed there for about 70 years. Um, but it's not an ethnic group. So here's this kid in this, this university class, and he starts going off, and the poison's coming out of his mouth, this, this radical anti-Semitism. And I was just blown away. I didn't realize, you know, that it was so fierce and so hostile. And I, you know, I fired back, and I just blasted the guy. But he was, he was relentless. And uh, so I, got, I beat him up right there in the class. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. What I'm just telling you the story because it's out there. It's out there. I mean, and it's a, it's, it's welcome mentality on college campuses on the United States. It thrives. My brother-in-law went to UC Berkeley, that vast bastion of conservative thought in California. (laughs) Now he's Jewish. He's Israeli. His mother tongue is Hebrew. And yet the demonstrations against Israel are so violent. And so radical, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I asked my in-laws, why are you sending this kid to this school? You know, I mean, they support the killing of the Jews wholesale. 
I mean, the speakers that they come on. I mean, it's just so radical. But that, that's all over the United States and Europe. It's radical what's happening in our country today. But God says that he'll never forsake the Jews. As a matter of fact, the fact that Israel is a nation today is a miracle. Remember when we looked at Hosea chapter 5? Look at verse 15. Here's a prophecy that I believe has come to pass in our recent history. God says to the nation of Israel in Hosea 5.15, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. What offense? The fact that they rejected their own Messiah, Jesus. I will return to my place until they recognize their offense. Then they will seek me in their affliction. I pointed out to you that that word is tsar in the, in the Hebrew. It speaks of, it's the same word Jacob's trouble found in Deuteronomy. It's the same word as tribulation found in another place. In the tribulation, they will seek me. Same as when uh, the brothers of Joseph rejected him. In the seven-year period of famine, they recognize him. In the future, there's a great tribulation coming. And in that tribulation, it's a seven-year period, the nation of Israel will turn to receive Jesus once again. Until then, they're just trickling in. One here, one there, hopefully hundreds here and hundreds there. But, but wholesale, the Jews aren't coming into the kingdom of God. They're not receiving Jesus. But it says there, I will return to my place. What's God's place? In heaven. So Jesus rejected the offense of the Jews, ascended back into heaven. Then in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Come, the people now respond, and they say, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, notice that, I've got it circled in my Bible. You might want to underline it. After two days, he will revive us. That's interesting because Moses would say over in Psalm chapter 90 that a thousand years to the Lord is as one day. Peter picks up on this and in his epistle, he says, don't lose heart, brothers and sisters. Remember that a day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is as a day. But here, interestingly, embedded in Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 is a prophecy that says after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. So according to God's time calendar, Israel was torn. They were split. They were dismantled as a nation 2,000 years ago. They will be regathered in the Holy Land after how long? Verse 2 says after two days. Or according to God's time calendar, 2,000 years. And that's exactly what's happened. After 2,000 years of being dispersed, withered, dried up, shriveled like a fig tree, they were revived. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, which is the next few years that we're seeing, it says there, he will raise us up. And so the nation of Israel has actually become a country once again. It's actually been reborn. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 36. We'll look at Ezekiel 36 and a couple of verses in 37. Ezekiel 36 verse 11 says, I will multiply upon you man and beast. God is speaking to this historical land of Israel or Palestine as it was known for thousands of years. He says, I will multiply upon you man and beast. They shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Again, in verse 24, we read this. God says, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. That's amazing. Your own land. Circle that in your Bible. Your own land. Then God gives Ezekiel this amazing vision found in chapter 37. I'll summarize it for you. God took Ezekiel to this valley. And in this valley, Ezekiel saw that it was filled with bones. Bleached white from the sun, you can imagine in your mind, filled with dry bones. This vision of a valley filled with dry bones. And God says to Ezekiel, hey, can these bones live? And Ezekiel does the best thing that you can do when you don't know the answer. You just say, Lord, you know. And Ezekiel said, Lord, you know if they can live. And God said, okay, I want you to prophesy to them. And so Ezekiel began to speak to the bones. He said, come together. I don't know exactly what he said. But in Ezekiel 37, it says, as he prophesied, the bones began to rattle. They began to shake. They began to roll and they came together 
And then all of a sudden, as these bones came together, they were ma- you know, wrapped with sinew and, and with ligaments and with tendons and flesh came on their body. And all of a sudden, rather than a valley full of dry bones, it was a valley filled with bodies. And then God asked Ezekiel another question. He said, can these, can these bodies live? Can they live? And Ezekiel said the same thing. Lord, you know, I don't know. And God said, prophesy to them that breath fills them. So Ezekiel begins to speak. And the Bible says they're filled with breath. And they all stand up and they're a giant army. And if you look at Ezekiel 37, verse 11, God interprets this vision to Ezekiel. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. So prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. You're dead, you're lost, you're dispersed. But I'm going to open those graves and bring you back to the land of Israel, God says. Then you will know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And then I will place you in your own land. Notice that again, in your own land. Circle that. It says, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. In your own land. I'm going to put you back. Back in the 1800s, the late 1800s, a movement began among the Jews in Europe to form a homeland once again. To find a place. Anti-Semitism was rising. It was in France. It was in Germany. People were chanting against the Jews, kill the Jews, kill the Jews. And so they said, hey, guys, let's all get together, you know, and find a country for ourselves. One of the leaders of this movement was Theodore Herzl. Though his life was short, he sparked this desire of the Jews to find a homeland. The movement was called Zionism. Zionism basically says that we believe the Jews have a right to exist. They should have a country. And back then, in the late 1800s, 1880, 1890, they had no place. And so Herzl began to work with different political groups. Though his life was short, he only lived 44 years. He died in 1904. He wrote a book called Judenstadt, The Jewish State. He worked with different governments, and he was looking for a place. Hey, can the Jews live in this area? And everywhere he went to these governments to give them land or to find a place, they all voted no. Everywhere. I mean, they looked everywhere, too. East Africa, they said no. The Sinai Peninsula, this wilderness, they said no. Kenya, no. Madagascar was suggested, no. A place up in Germany, in Russia, no. They said no everywhere. They voted against it every time. And he died in 1904. But by then, the desire of these Jews to have their own homeland was growing. There were some Jews, probably about 20,000 in Israel, spread out. It was just swamp over there. But what had happened was it sparked the hearts of the Jews that they wanted to aim for their traditional historical homeland. Palestine is what it was called. The location had special meaning, but the land itself was a disaster. It was a waste. See, the Turks in the Ottoman Empire, we talked about them a couple of weeks ago, taxed the people of Israel according to the number of trees on their land. Hardly any Jews. There were mostly Arabs, mixed ethnic groups. And they said, "Um, we're going to tax you according to the number of trees on your land. What do you think happened? Everybody cut their trees down. Everybody said, just cut them down, lower the taxes for ourselves. So what happened was erosion came, um, the climate changed, uh, swamps began to proliferate, and the entire country just went to the dogs. I mean, it was, it was wretched. And that's kind of what the Bible prophesied was, would happen. Uh, the Bible said that, that the place would be not deforested, but desolate, underpopulated, economically stagnant. Mark Twain visited there in 1869. He wrote, quote, It's a country that's desolate, whose soil is rich enough, but it's given wholly to weeds. A silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, whose fast friends of a worthless soil had almost deserted the country. So the land was a waste. It was a swamp. The Jews actually that were there began to buy land from the Arabs who owned it. They, they gave them good money, but the people that were selling it thought, you guys are stupid. This is a swamp. I'll sell you a swamp anytime. But what happened is the Jews began to plant trees. They, they planted eucalyptus trees because apparently those grow according to the amount of water they have. The more water, the faster they grow. The less water, the less they grow. They began to drain the land. 
They began to reclaim the soil. After World War I, the British army actually freed Jerusalem and the land of Palestine, as it was known for all those years, from Turkish control. And in 1917, the British government issued a declaration concerning the Jews. It was called the Balfour Declaration. These are some of the words. It says, His Majesty's government, with favor toward the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, November 2, 1917. All of a sudden, the government that had taken over said, okay, you can live here. And so the Jews began to plow the ground. They began to plant trees. They purchased the land with their own money. They began to arrive in boats and show up in Israel. It was hard life, too. They, they lived on community farms called kibbutzim, or, or, or what we would call a moshav, a collective farm. 2,700 years earlier, Isaiah said that this is the exact thing that would happen. Isaiah 41, verses 19 and 20 say this. God says, I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. And so in their own land, as Ezekiel said, They were willing to live in Africa, in Kenya, in Russia, anywhere. Give us a neighborhood. And all of a sudden, the British government said, well, you can have your old home. So they moved in. They began to plant. And the words of Isaiah 2,700 years earlier began to actually happen. God said, I will plant in the wilderness trees. You know, in the past 100 years, Israel has planted over 250 million trees. That's a quarter of a billion trees. Israel is the only country in the world to have more trees in it at the beginning of the 21st century than it had at the beginning of the 20th century. There's no other country in the world that has more trees today than it did 100 years ago, except Israel. A quarter billion trees. The word of God was fulfilled. Another prophecy about Israel being fruitful, that fig tree beginning to put out its branch, as Jesus said, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, you know it. Isaiah 27, verse 6, in those days, Jacob will take root and Israel will bud. I love that verse. Israel will bud and blossom and fill the entire world with fruit. You're crazy, Isaiah. This is a swamp. Israel's not going to fill a basket with fruit. And, and you're saying that Israel's going to fill the world with fruit? Are you nuts? Did you know that Israel is the third largest producer of fruit on the planet? It's the size of New Jersey. It's a tiny little country. And it exports $800 million of produce every year. The Bible also says in Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1, the desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. It's a swamp. Israel was full of malaria. It was full of mosquitoes. It was full of those, you know, microorganisms and bacteria. And people were dying all over the place. They could hardly live. And yet Israel today is one of the number one producers of flowers. $200 million of flowers a year are exported out of Israel. The Bible's true. The desert will rejoice and blossom as the rose. It's an interesting verse in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. God says this. I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. What does that mean? I will restore to the peoples a pure language. All the Jews that were coming back were coming from Ethiopia, from Russia, from Germany, from France, all over North Africa. They were coming to Israel and they all spoke different languages. Hebrew was dead for over 2,000 years. When they were carried away to, uh, to Babylon, uh, when they were carried away by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and then the, the Syrians came in and destroyed the land, Hebrew pretty much died. They spoke kind of a Hebrew dialect, but Hebrew died as a language for 2,000 years. But God says, I will restore a pure language. Nobody spoke Hebrew. But a man by the name of Eleazar ben Yehuda in 1881 moved to Israel. He wanted people to speak Hebrew again. Everybody laughed at him. I mean, there's no way that you can revive a language that's been dead 2,000 years. It's an amazing thing about Hawaiian. The language of Hawaiian is actually revived, but it was only 100 years or so. And it was still spoken, not completely dead. But here, Jewish people all over the world speaking different languages, they didn't even speak Hebrew. They spoke Yiddish, but Yiddish is mostly German. 
it is hardly related to Hebrew. And all of a sudden, Eliezer ben Yehuda went to Israel and he began speaking Hebrew with his children. His children would play in the fields. Nobody else understood what they were saying. They were speaking Hebrew. These guys were speaking Arabic and, and these others were speaking uh, Russian and these were speaking French and these were speaking German. These were speaking Italian. And all of a sudden, people began to learn Hebrew. And the scripture that God gave in Zephaniah chapter 3, I will restore a pure language, came to pass. Zephaniah 3, 9, I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may serve me as one. Hebrew is spoken by 7 million people today. The Bible's come to pass in our, in our lifetime, in our century. My wife's first language is Hebrew. I don't like it. I don't know what she's saying about me to her parents. It's exactly what God said would happen. Jesus said, watch the fig tree when it begins to grow, when it comes back into the land, when it takes root, when it puts out its branch. Know for sure that I'm coming close. Oh, Jesus is coming as soon. I hate to close on a sorrowful note, but Israel's going to be surrounded by enemies just prior to Jesus coming. Turn over to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3. God says, it will happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. Though, notice this, all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Now, how could anybody say that Jerusalem would be a heavy stone? And here, Zechariah gives a picture of of, of this heavy stone that everybody who tries to lift it up, you know, they hurt their back or they, they pull some muscle. And God says, Jerusalem is going to be like that, a heavy stone. Every nation in the world is going to try to pick it up and try to deal with this problem of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is nothing. It has no natural resources. It is absolutely in an unstrategic location. But for some reason, it's the center of three major world religions. And people are fighting over Jerusalem all the time. It's the one hotbed issue in the Middle East. And God here says that all the nations of the earth will be gathered against Jerusalem. Jerusalem and against Israel. So after the Balfour Declaration, the Jews began to emigrate to Israel. They began to speak Hebrew. And then the Second World War helped with the establishment of the nation of Israel. Um, After the Holocaust, the United Nations declared Israel to be a state in May of 1948. And on the day that they declared independence, the Arab League Secretary General Azam Pasha declared jihad or a holy war. And this is what he said. This will be a war of extermination and momentous massacre. The Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al-Husseini said, I declare a holy war, my Muslim brothers. Murder the Jews. Murder them all. Sounds like guys in the news today, doesn't it? At that point, the armies of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and Iraq, six nations invaded this tiny new country. My grandfather-in-law actually fought in that war for survival, Sabasvi. He defended Israel, but God was really the one that defended her. Though six nations launched attacks from all sides against Israel, they survived. It was a war for independence in 1948. Less than 20 years later, May 15, 1967, all of these nations moved their troops to the borders as well. Egyptian forces in the Sinai. Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia moved their troops to Israel's borders as well. And the question, why were they advancing to invade Israel? President Nasser of Egypt said it very simply. Our basic goal, he said, is the destruction of Israel. Why are you going to fight against Israel? Oh, we want to destroy it. (laughs) Why? I don't know. That just sounds like something good to do. May 15th, spring, why not? Everything's alive. Let's go kill the Jews. On June 5th, Israel decided to launch a preemptive attack. And in 1967, of course, it's known as the Six-Day War. And they they launched a preemptive attack against all five of these countries at the same time. And despite being attacked from all sides and facing overwhelming odds against them, Israel actually captured the Sinai Peninsula, where the Egyptians had amassed their forces. They captured the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and all of the Golan Heights in six days. They finished it so that they could have a weekend. It was amazing. It was God on their side. (laughs) And so, less than 10 years later, just about six years later, on October 6th of 1973, 
That was when Egypt in the south and Syria in the north coordinated a surprise attack on Israel. Yom Kippur was the day. That's the most holy day of the year for the Jews. Everybody fasts that day. Nobody drives. It's a Sabbath day. Uh, nobody works. Nobody does anything. And so Egypt and Syria thought it would coordinate a surprise attack against them. From the north and the south they came. Actually, nine different Arab states, including four non-Middle Eastern nations, actually aided Syria and Egypt in the war effort. They gave men, they gave troops, they gave weapons, they gave money. On the Golan Heights, Israel had 180 tanks. The Syrians, 1,400. Along the Suez Canal in the south, there were 500 Israeli soldiers. How many Egyptians? 80,000. What happened? Israel won. Again. How do you do that? How do you have 180 tanks against 1,400 and win? Well, how did the Midianites get defeated by Gideon when he only had 300 men? The sword of the Lord. Well, you know the story about Israel. Israel surrounded by those who openly state their desire to destroy every last one of them. You're smart enough to go online and look at the news to see what's being said. Anti-Semitism is on the rise it's satanically charged. It's shocking to realize, as I've mentioned before, that Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, is on the bestseller list of Turkey and Egypt. Did you know that? Radical. There's a, a clothing store in Hong Kong. It's called Izu. It actually began outfitting its stores with Nazi regalia. Nazi flags, swastikas, shirts with the skull of, of the SS troops, Third Reich flags, they actually show propaganda films on the walls of their store. It was in Hong Kong. There's another bar that actually had pictures of German soldiers shooting Jews through the head into mass graves. You're thinking, how is this possible? The world is totally susceptible, apart from Jesus Christ, to the anti-Semitism that is thriving. There is a restaurant in Mumbai, India, called Hitler's Cross, it has posters of Hitler and goose-stepping soldiers deifying Adolf Hitler. It's radical. In the Palestinian elections just over a year ago, one of the candidates decided to change his name to Adolf Hitler. One in a landslide. How can you explain that? How do you explain the world's most brutal, bloodthirsty, hateful person being now deified all over the world in subcultures. Satanic. It's radical. This is from yesterday's... Actually, it's from this morning's news. I was up early. Ynetnews.com. Iranian president said Israel's disappearance imminent. The countdown to Israel's destruction has begun, Iranian president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said in a speech commemorating the death of Iranian revolution leader Ayatollah Khomeini. This is what Ahmadinejad said. The arrogant superpowers and Zionist regime invested all their efforts, but after 60 years, their pride has been trampled and the countdown to the destruction has been started. The final victory and the destruction is near. This is a man who just about has nuclear weapons at his fingertips. One thing that Israel has learned over the centuries is that if somebody says they want to kill you, they mean it because it's happened time and time again. After the pogroms and the Inquisition and the death camps in Nazi Germany and in Poland, they realize that when the world says they hate you and want to destroy you, they mean it. In Genesis 3.15, God said, I'm going to put enmity between the woman and the serpent. And then over in Revelation chapter 12, God gives a picture. The woman gives birth to a child who is to rule the earth, the Bible says, with a rod of iron, Jesus. But he's caught up to heaven and to the throne of God. And then the Bible says that this serpent, this dragon, Satan, begins to chase the woman. And it chases Israel into the wilderness for three and a half years. Let's close by looking at just a couple of scriptures. You're in Zechariah. Verse 9 of chapter 12. It will be in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. 
All nations will come against Jerusalem. And God says, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. They will see Jesus again when he comes. Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and those who are sent to you. I would have gathered your children as a hen gathers her chick under her wings, but you were not willing. Woe unto you. Your house is left desolate until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel one day will be under such great threat from the nations of the world and the Antichrist that they will flee into the wilderness, the Bible says, for three and a half years, probably to a city called Petra. And from there, the Bible says that God will pour on them the spirit of grace. And they will say, oh, Jesus, we've rejected you in the past, but we receive you now. And what will happen? Zechariah 14, verse 3. I will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Remember Jesus, when he ascended, the angel said, why are you looking into heaven, you guys from Galilee? The same Jesus will come in the same way. And the Bible here says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, where they ascended from 2,000 years ago, which faces Jerusalem. And this mountain will be split in two, east to west, a very large valley, and so forth and so on. When God pours out on Israel his spirit again, they will cry out and say, oh, Jesus, Blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. And at that point, all heaven will break loose on the earth. Victory will be gained. Israel will have been hidden in the desert for three and a half years. And the Jews will be safe from the hatred of the Antichrist and the wrath of God. Wrath of God, yeah, that's right. There's a period of time known as the tribulation where God pours out his wrath on the earth. Those who believe in Jesus Christ will have been rescued, raptured, taken to heaven before it happens. The Jews will at that point in time embrace the Antichrist. They'll think he's the Messiah. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name. Him you will receive. They will receive the Antichrist. They will build a temple, the Bible says. And in the middle of that period of time, the Antichrist will go in and say, I was just kidding. I'm God, worship me. And at that point in time, that is such an abomination that it will leave the entire land, the entire world desolate. God will begin to pour out his wrath. The judgments found in Revelation chapter 6 through 19 will come upon the earth, but Israel will be spared. What does that mean for you and me? Number one, love the Jews. Love the Jews. I think God chose the most stiff-necked, hard-hearted people in the world to love. Because that the Jews, they're privileged. They're blessed everywhere they go. There's more Nobel Prize winners that are Jewish than any other ethnic group in the world. God has blessed them. They've been ostracized and cast out, and yet God blesses them financially. He blesses them with talent. He blesses them with giftedness, and they still reject him. And God, it's as if he would say, you know what? I'll show you how much I can love by loving these guys. I used to just have this fascination. I thought the Jews were the nicest people in the world. They're not. They're sinners. They're hard. They're cold. They're calloused. They're like you and like me. And God loves them. So you love the Jews too. Seek to be a blessing to Israel and God will bless you. One day as I was talking with Pastor Chuck and asking him about the fact that they've invested so much in Israel. Chuck just said in a cavalier, not a cavalier way, but just a matter of fact way, he said, well, that's why I think Calvary Chapel has been so blessed because they've blessed Israel. Millions of dollars. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. God said to Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing. Those who bless you, I will bless. Be a blessing to the Jews. Love the Jews. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Seek to share God's love with the Jews. Realize this, secondly, You are God's chosen people. God has a plan for the Jews, but there is no hope of salvation by virtue of the fact that you are one ethnicity or another. No Jew will get to heaven because they are Jewish. They still need Jesus Christ. And so while we have favor for the Jews, never think that you're a second-rate person because you're not a certain ethnicity. 
You are God's chosen people, believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Not a nation, not a country, not a piece of property in the Middle East. It's all about Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus, you are God's chosen people. Realize this, God's love for you isn't conditioned on your goodness, but on his goodness. You might slip up, you might fail, but God's grace toward you is in Jesus Christ. You're the object of his affection. So while you love the Jews, realize this, that you are God's chosen people. And finally, let's get ready for the Lord's return. Let's not get caught up with the trivial things of this world. Let's invest our heart in the kingdom of heaven. Let everything be done through that lens of the old saying, soon this life will be passed and only what is done for Christ will last. Father in heaven, we pray that this word from your scripture pierces and penetrates our hearts. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the salvation of ethnic Jews. And we pray, Lord, for your return quickly. It says there in the book of Revelation, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And so we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.